Thank you very much. You may please be seated. I'd like to welcome everyone again and introduce to us the guests that we have in our midst this morning for this 15th webinar series, virtually or physically. I'd like to recognize the presence of the Vice Chancellor Landmark University, Professor Adini Yolayonju, here seated with us this morning. I'd like to also introduce to us and welcome the Registrar of Landmark University, Ms. Adefunke Fola Oinloye. I'd like to also introduce the Dean School of Postgraduate Studies in absentia, or probably she's on virtually. Deans of Colleges here present physically and virtually. Dean Student Affairs, Landmark University. Heads of Academic Departments, the Professorate, the Chaplains, the Director of Financial Services, Director, Center for Learning Resources, Director, Physical Planning and Development, Director, Center for Systems and Information Services, Director, Health Services, Director, Academic Planning, then the Director, Landmark University Center for Research, Innovation and Discovery, Discoveries, Lucrate, Professor Adepesin here present, Director, University Wide Courses, Dr. Lawal here present with us, and also like to introduce the Associate Professor, uh, guest lecturer for this webinar series, Associate Professor M.O.N. Kunuji, and members of faculty and staff, and also our esteemed students, kings and queens present here today. Ladies and gentlemen, you are most welcome. A round of applause, please. Standing on the already established protocols, I welcome everyone here once again. To take us further in this event, permit me to call on the Head of Department Sociology, Landmark University, Dr. Dele Razal, to take the prologue of the webinar. Thank you so much. I personally want to welcome all of us here physically and those online. The mission of the Department of Sociology is to produce high quality research and scholarship, as well as achieve excellence in undergraduate and postgraduate um, teaching. In line with this mission, um, the department decided to put this off in, by joining the the College of Business and Management Sciences. And by so doing, we have also tried as much as we can to attach our support to the university research goals. Based on that, the choice of this um, topic came about as a result of some factors. Number one is there's a common question in sociology that is sociology a science. It's a basic question for elementary sociology that is sociology truly a science? 
as a result of that, we intend to look at it, which I know the guest speaker is gonna do justice to. The other thing is to enable students in the social science discipline presence present accurate and reliable data, as well as avoid statistical errors and find a way to deal with everyday challenges like outliers, missing data, data altering, data mining, or developing graphical representations. Finally, the goal of enhancing faculty and the university visibility through media and journal citation prompted our support and action of the series of webinar, which this is the third for the Department of Sociology and the 15th for Lucred. I haven't said this, I employ all of us to sit still while we go through this subject matter. And I'm assuring you that the guest speaker is gonna do justice to this issue. Thank you everyone and please, you're all welcome again. Another round of applause for my HOD. Permit me to also call on the Dean, College of Business and Social Sciences to take us on the welcome address, Dr. F. Ashamusa. You're welcome. Thank you, Ma. Dama University College of Business and Social Sciences, welcome address by the Dean CBS at the third webinar series of the Department of Sociology. The team of the, the, top, the, the, team of the study is the understanding the, the dynamic of data analysis and interpretation in social science research. It is with great excitement that I want to bring this remark at uh, this third webinar series of, for sociology. I want to appreciate the management of Lama University, able led by the Vice Chancellor, Professor Adeni Olari Yanju, for approving this webinar at a time like this. To our maybe registrar in absentia and do look great, you are appreciated. Special admission to the elder guest speaker, Dr. Wei Kunuji, all deans in absentia, HOD of sociology, and other HOD that are in their office. You are welcome to this uh, webinar series. So the, the, I ask one question, what data analysis, in, why data analysis in social sciences? Data analysis in social sciences is a process of obtaining raw data and subsequently converting it to information useful for decision making by users. Also, data is collected and interpreted to answer questions, test hypotheses, or disapprove theories. Data analysis methods are likely based on two core areas, which is quantitative and uh, qualitative methods. Once the data has been analyzed, the next pro progressive step is to interpret the data. But interpretation is the process of assigning meaning to process analyzed data. At the end, it enables us to make informed and meaningful conclusion with cost efficient. The special guest today, we doing justice to what this topic entail. I hope that this webinar will equip participants with understanding that a well processed data has greater impact on the conclusion drawn from social science research. It is on this note that I want to employ, to employ us to listen to this lecture as we draw from the wealth of experience of the speaker. Once again, 
I welcome you to this webinar series of Amazing Lama University. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Can we appreciate the team? College of uh, Business and Social Sciences, once again. Um, the Vice Chancellor, sir. Uh, members of management here are in present, standing on the already established protocols. Um, just by the team, understanding the dynamics of data analysis and interpretation in social science research. I want to make it known unto us that uh, it is not a thing of uh, social sciences alone. Uh, in the uh, days that we are in currently, uh, data is a main thing. Do you want to talk about artificial intelligence? Do you want to talk about data mining? Do you want to talk about uh, big data science? So uh, in most researches, these days, uh, data is of essence and it is very important. However, to take us further in this uh, webinar this morning, I have the singular honor of inviting someone whom God has put in place and in charge of running the affairs of Landmark University. No other person like the amiable Vice Chancellor of Landmark University, the person of uh, Professor Adeniyi Olayoju. Please, I want us to appreciate him as we bring him on for his opening remarks. You're welcome, sir. Thank you, the new field. You may please be seated. I want to especially congratulate the Department of uh, Social Sciences, Business and Social Sciences, and in particular, the Department of Sociology and that of the SDG 10, Reduce Inequality, Cluster. Studio. The theme of this webinar is understanding the dynamics of data analysis and interpretation in social science research. I want to especially recognize the registrar of this great university, Ms. Fala Onyiloye, the Dean College of Business and Social Sciences, the Director, Landmark University Center for Research, Innovation and Discovery. Of course, our guest speaker, Dr. Mohen Kunuji, the head of Department of Sociology, Dr. Bamidele Razak, our SDG 10 team lead, Dr. Mrs. Chisa Igoleku, and all members of that research cluster. I recognize our undergraduate students from the Department of Sociology and lot of postgraduate students here present, members of the university community, of course, online participants from all walk of life. It is with great pleasure once again that I warmly welcome you to the 15th Lucrid webinar series, Council of Department of Sociology and our SDG 10 research cluster. You will agree with me like always that the theme of this webinar, understanding the dynamics of data analysis and interpretation in social science research is apt and of course in alignment with Landmark University strategy goals five, seven, 10, 11, and 12. The university has 12 strategy goals. And like I just mentioned, this webinar has direct bearing with LSG5, talking about financial self-sufficiency. Seven, talking about research, innovation, and discovery. Eight, talks about human resources. Of course, nine, talks about innovation and discovery. 10, talks about budgeting. And 11, talks about plan scheduling. 12, talks about monitoring and evaluation. All of these require knowledge of statistical data and that of uh, analysis. Landmark University has this big vision of being a leading world-class university, of course, by spearheading an agrarian revolution on the African continent through the expression of hidden treasures in the modern art. And that is why we are embracing the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. In other words, as much as 
we are thinking global. We have to start local. So what we are trying to do is to synergize between landmark strategic goals and the 17 sustainable goals of the United Nations. The goals that is also very relevant into this webinar is that of SDG 10, talking about reduce inequalities. Uh, if you look at that sign of inequality, that talks about data analysis. So it is to reduce inequality within and among countries. And the exploit of that team or cluster is what you are seeing on the screen. Data analysis. The systematic application of statistical and log logical techniques to describe the data school, modularize the data structure, condense the data representation, illustrate via images, tables, and graph, and evaluate statistical relation, probability data, and derive meaningful conclusion. These analytical procedures enable us as faculty, as researchers, to induce the underlying inference from data by eliminating the unnecessary chaos created by its rest. Data generation, therefore, is a continual process. This makes data analysis continuous, iterative process, where the collection and performing data analysis simultaneously. Ensuring data integrity, however, of data analysis. There are various examples where data analysis is used, ranging from transportation, risk and fraud detection, customer interaction, city planning healthcare, web search, digital advertisement, and of course, more and more. Considering the example of healthcare, as we saw during the outbreak of uh, COVID-19, where we have coronavirus hospitals that are faced with challenge of coping up with pressure in treating as many patients as possible. Considering data analysis allow them to monitor machine and data usage in such scenario to achieve efficiency gain. There are different techniques for data analysis depending upon the question at art, the type of data and the amount of data gathered. Each focuses on taking on to the new data, mining insights and drilling down into the information to transform facts and figure into decision-making parameter. Data analysis, therefore, is key to any business, whether starting up a new venture, making marketing decision, continue with a particular course of action, or going for a complete shutdown. The inferences and the statistical probability calculated from data analysis have based the most critical decisions by ruling out all human bias. Different analytical tools have overlapping functions and different limitations, but they are also complementary tools. Before choosing a data analytical tool, it is therefore essential to consider the scope of work, infrastructure limitation, economic feasibility, and the final report to be prepared. This is the more reason we are engaging the veteran, the expert, our own associate professor, M.O.N. Kunoji, from the Department of Sociology, University of Lagos, who is very fast in the subject of discourse. This webinar promises to bring our way latest software packages that will help us in our research endeavor. It is on this note that I want to welcome our distinguished guest speaker and appreciate him for the privilege to draw from his wealth of knowledge and experience via this webinar. I also want to congratulate Dr. Chisa Iboleku for the maiden webinar coming from the SDG 10 Reduce Inequality Platform, for the passion and the seal with which she's driving the cluster and for our initiative and contribution to the actualization of our vision of becoming a world-class university. Of course, special thanks has to go to our amiable head of department of sociology, Dr. Bamidele Rasak, who indeed is the organizer of this webinar and for facilitating the linkage with the guest speaker. I wish you all 
a memorable webinar. Come down with us and we will do you good for the Lord has spoken good concerning us. Thank you and God bless. You may please be seated. Vatigemo, Vice Chancellor, for that exquisite and robust presentation. Give it to him once more. At this juncture, permit me to invite for the citation of the guest speaker, Mr. Oyeyiko Joseph. A round of applause for him as he comes forward, please. Good morning, everyone. The Vice Chancellor, sir, standing on the already established protocol, I will proceed with the citation of the guest speaker, Dr. Michael Kunuji. Dr. Michael O. Kunuji is an associate professor of sociology from the department from the University of Lagos. He is an expert in social research methodology with a general interest in population studies. He is a sociologist by training, and his research is traced across, across human sexuality, adolescence, and youth sexual and reproductive health, intimate partner violence, social exclusion, and health systems and policies. His research is focused on understanding social context of youth and adolescent sexuality, health systems, and health delivery in Nigeria. With support from USAID, coordinating implementing implementation research to communicate learning and evidence, SECO, and the National Population Commission, Dr. Kunuji designed and led the implementation of Nigeria's first qualitative verbal and social autopsy of under five deaths, which explores contextual factors in child mortality in Nigeria. Dr. Kunuji is also a principal investigator in several ongoing studies, which include a study of sexual and reproductive health need and challenges of girls and young women in humanitarian context, both in Nigeria and Uganda. Also workplace challenges of frontline workers in Nigeria's battle against COVID-19 and many more. He has also benefited from international training on research methodology and innovations on how to change negative social norms around domestic violence. His research works are published in several high quality peer reviewed international journals. And on this note, I present to you all, Dr. Michael Kunuji for his presentation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me, please? Good morning. Please, I need to be sure you can hear me. Yes, yes we can. can. OK. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, uh, please permit me to stand on the already established uh, protocol. I have a 30-minute uh, presentation. And I must confess that um, the title of the presentation is somewhat a challenge to me, uh, partly because I did not choose uh, that title. And I have been struggling to get into the mind of the people who proposed this title. Um, but I'm uh, not convinced yet that I have succeeded fully in getting into their minds. But I should also say that the Vice Chancellor's presentation has been an excellent one on uh, the topic of today, data analysis and in, uh, interpretation, uh, which means that to a large extent, my work has been made uh, easier. 
Uh, I want to especially thank uh, Dr. Dele Razak for the opportunity. And I I will uh, begin by attempting a definition of uh, the key, the key phrases, the key concepts in this uh, title. And specifically, I want us uh, to focus on data analysis. What exactly do we mean by uh, data analysis? Of course, I'm I'm aware that many of us are familiar with. Uh, that concept, the concept of data analysis, but uh, for um, the purpose of this presentation, I would like to describe data analysis as that process of transforming raw data into research findings or into results. So by implication, we're saying that data analysis can be likened to the production process through which we turn raw materials into finished products. Just the way we produce things or uh, manufacture uh, finished products from raw materials, uh, researchers also process their raw data in order to come up with outputs that we can say uh, provide answers to the research questions we set out at the beginning uh, to answer. And then uh, what do we mean by interpretation? If we're talking about interpretation of results, um, and I think uh, I think it was the registrar that mentioned this earlier, we're talking about interpretation, we're talking about making meaning of the results. <clears throat> so it is not sufficient to run a statistical test. Or it is not sufficient to say that uh, we have uh, some research findings, it's important also to ask, what exactly does this mean? This finding we have before us, what does it mean? What meaning can we make um, from it? What conclusions can we reach uh, from the results? Uh, so when we provide answers to such questions, uh, we will say that we have uh, succeeded in interpreting uh, the result. Sometimes data analysis is used as a generic term to describe analysis as well as interpretation. That is, sometimes we just say data analysis when actually we are referring to data analysis as well as uh, the interpretation. And at other times, a completely different term, which is data management, is also used. Data management is a broader concept uh, that um, encompasses um, um, data, data analysis, data interpretation, and several other steps. And uh, this diagram that we have here uh, shows us uh, what data management entails. Um, and I have deliberately included data collection uh, some people will think that, okay, data collection is a, a different phase of research and that when you're done with your uh, data collection, you can now talk about analysis. But I uh, hold the view that data analysis actually begins from the time that you collect your data and perhaps earlier, uh, earlier because uh, the, the type of data you collect, how you collect your data, these are all decisions that will be taken in the design phase of, uh, your, of, of your project. So uh, the data collection process is also an integral part of uh, data management. And depending on the type of data you have, you may need to also screen the data, you may need to edit the data, you may need to code the data. And it's also, uh, Okay, so traditionally, when all of this is done, you may now need to enter the data into a machine, into a computer uh, for, for processing, okay? But with modern day technology, uh, with the open uh, data kits and uh, platforms like uh, 
uh, platforms that are built on the open data kits, like uh, the cover toolbox, like uh, the red cap, uh, it, uh, it is possible to combine data collection and data capturing such that at the end of your data collection, you don't have need again uh, for, um, for data entry. Also, uh, this new technology uh, uh, makes it possible to use constraints to limit the need for uh, maybe screening for editing because um, you can you can use the computer algorithm to to limit the type of responses you can get from respondents, which means that many of the errors that we typically would correct when editing uh, or issues that we will typically address when screening, it's possible to use such uh, platforms to uh, uh, make it completely impossible for those errors to be fed into the system in the first place. So you don't have the need to, to now um, maybe screen or say you want to edit. Of course, if you have open-ended questions, there will still be the need uh, for uh, some coding, okay? So at the end of all of that, we will expect that you will clean up the data which means that uh, you may still need to provide maybe value labels and um, uh, do some more cleaning so that your analysis, so that the computer uh, is in a, a good position to process, to analyze your data. It is when you now have clean data that you can now talk about uh, data analysis. Um, and then, when you analyze your data, you can then proceed to uh, interpretation. But I shall point out that what we have here um, applies uh, largely to uh, a particular type of data, statistical or numerical or quantitative data. And I sense that there is that bias um, uh, that there is the preference for quantitative data, which is normal. M many people, uh, possibly in your university, there may also be that preference, uh, whether you're talking about uh, the research done by students or research done by uh, faculty, there is the preference for, uh, qualitative, for quantitative data. But uh, recently, there has been that resurgence also, and people are beginning to appreciate and value uh, qualitative data more. And so uh, what we have here may not strictly apply to uh, the processing of quantitative, uh, qualitative data. So I should point out, and I am happy that we are talking about dynamics, we are talking about uh, nuances. So. Uh, the first thing we need to give attention to, note carefully, is that data can be qualitative as well as quantitative. And if we say we have qualitative data, essentially we're saying that we have data that really we uh, cannot subject to rigorous statistical analysis. Okay, so if, for instance, you have you have, you have uh, conducted interviews, you have focus group discussions, uh, you have uh, you've done an ethnographic study, or you have uh, used observation as a method of data collection, or you're collecting uh, information through meetings, you will have lots and lots of texts. Or you could have um, maybe audio recordings, or you could have videos, you could have pictures. So you'll say this is qualitative because it is, it is not the type of data you typically want to subject to statistical analysis. You don't want to begin to run statistical tests when you're dealing with texts or when you're dealing with pictures or, or, or video or audio recordings. Okay. So, uh, and I should also point out that the philosophies behind the collection and analysis of qualitative and quantitative data differ significantly. 
uh, with uh, qualitative data, you, you are likely to be uh, more inductive, which means that you are going, moving from uh, a, uh, the particular, from the, the, the particular to the, to the general, and you're also likely to be more uh, ideographic, which means that you're looking at specific cases. Uh, and of course, in some uh, situations, it's not even possible to generalize with the type of data uh, you have. But with quantitative data, you are more uh, deductive in your reasoning and your perspective is more nomothetic, which means that you're looking more at a cross-sectional um uh, pattern uh, when you're using a quantitative when you're doing quantitative uh you're, you're gathering quantitative data analyzing quantitative data and uh typically you get quantitative data from surveys from censuses from experiments maybe from registers and uh, for those who do big data people who maybe mine um uh, so the social media, mind Facebook, uh, maybe get information from maybe uh, Google and other major um, other major companies where uh, millions and millions of people all over the world uh, register. It's very likely that you'll be collecting quantitative data that you are able to subject to. Uh, statistical analysis and because the uh the data we're talking about because the type of data we're talking about th these different types are completely different we also have different tools or different uh different applications for processing them so if you are interested in processing qualitative data then you may want to learn about how to use atlas ti or you learn to use uh, deduce or use nvivo and i also know that some people use spreadsheets like excel spreadsheets uh for the management of uh, for the coding of qualitative data uh, but if your interest is uh, quantitative analysis, then you want to use maybe learn to use SPSS, use Stata, use R or Excel. There are several others like that. Okay. So I should also point out that quantitative analysis can be uh, merely descriptive or it can be explanatory, which means if, if we say it is explanatory, it simply means that we're looking at how one, uh, one variable influences another variable. And um, I assume here that we are familiar with the term variable. Uh, my simple way of explaining a variable is just to say a set of uh, logically connected attributes uh, with the capacity of varying within a population. So if you say it is very able, it means that it is able to vary within the population. So if you say sex within a population, it is a variable because uh, one, one case can be male, the other case can be female. If you say age is a variable, it is a variable because it can change. It's, it's because it varies within the other population. Okay, so we can have um, a univariate analysis, which means that that analysis is just uh, dealing with a single variable. So if our interest is to look at maybe frequencies, uh, fractions or relative frequencies or percentages, uh, measures of central tendency, measures of dispersion, measures of relative standing, all these can be used to describe a single uh, variable. So I can take just one variable like sex, for instance, I, and I can uh, get the frequencies. So uh, if I look at the number of people at, uh, uh, participating in this webinar, for instance, it's possible that we do a sex distribution. And at the end, we could say 75% uh, of the people are men, and 25% uh, of them are women and things like that. We can also use charts, different charts to represent such information. It's also possible that our analysis is bivariate, which means that we are looking at um, association between 
two variables. If we do a bivariate analysis, we're analyzing two variables simultaneously. And usually the aim is to, to tell whether one variable is associated with uh, the other. Uh, but we should also remind ourselves that association does not necessarily imply causal relationship which means that it is possible that two variables are associated, but not, not necessarily uh, having a causal, causal link uh, between them. But of course, association is a requirement uh, for uh, establishing causality. So it's possible that you have your analysis at that level. And it's also possible that you have quantitative analysis at the multivariate uh, level. In the social sciences, typically, we are interested in looking maybe at the joint effect of several independent variables. For instance, I may be interested in looking at um, uh, maybe variables like uh, background uh, characteristics, parents' income, parents' level of education, uh, religion, living arrangements, whether uh, the child lives with uh, both parents, uh, or for students, we could even say uh, living arrangement, whether the child stays on campus or off campus. We may want to look at the joint effect of all these variables on academic performance, on their CGPA, for instance. So the moment we do this type of analysis, we will say uh, we're doing um, uh, a multivariate analysis. And uh, the multivariate analysis is uh, very useful in the social sciences because it makes it possible for us to control the effect of uh, confounding uh, variables, okay? And in the social sciences, we are not quick to say that one variable causes another variable. Rather, we just look at variables that are associated. And if uh, at the multivariate level, we can see that, um, uh, we, we can see, we can establish that it, uh, an independent variable has a predictive uh, power in a model. Then we can now talk about uh, what a particular variable contributes to um, a change in a dependent variable. But like I said earlier, qualitative analysis is somewhat different from all of these um, like I also pointed out, the philosophy driving qualitative research is slightly different from what drives quantitative uh, research. It's possible also that we have a descriptive analysis when we do uh, qualitative uh, research. For instance, we can do a study that uh, seeks to explore, go to maybe a community, and then begin to have interviews, discussions with community members to find out, maybe cult, uh, find out about cultural practices, uh, find out about uh, their pre preferences, find out about the tradition of the people. If we do all of this, it's possible at the end of the day to do a descriptive analysis. That is, we are simply describing what we have. Uh, found what we have observed. It's also possible to um, to channel um, our analysis in qualitative research towards uh, grounded theory. That is, we seek to establish uh, patterns. We seek seek to establish uh, maybe a theory in an inductive way. That is, we will be moving from the particular now to the. Uh, general. The implication of this is that there will be no preconceptions at the beginning. We are not guided by any uh, theory or hypothesis that we seek to test. Rather, we're, we're just exploring uh, the data we have and we're building from ground up. So when we see that a particular uh, factor is found in a particular case, then we want to look for that or uh, look for that type of variable in other cases. And then we begin to compare cases in order to now establish uh, a common uh, pattern. That's what we do in uh, grounded 
uh, theory. And then the process itself is iterative, which means that we will do this repeatedly um, uh, until eventually we come up with a pattern that we, we can say, um, a, a, a pattern that cuts across a significant uh, uh, proportion of the uh, people we have, uh, the subjects, the people we have studied. Also, qualitative research can be targeted at uh, uh, conversational analysis. And the basic assumption here is that conversations are, social, are socially structured uh, human behavior. The implication is that context matters. In this type of analysis, we're interested in everything said as well as things not said. We're interested in interpreting even uh, what we refer to as paralinguistics. Uh, when someone says, mm, uh, or oh, things like that can actually have meanings within specific uh, contexts. So um, social researchers are also interested sometimes in content analysis. And also your analysis may be thematic, which means that you can have uh, a number of themes that um, you can predetermine or uh, you can allow to emerge naturally as you code your, as you code your data. Okay, so the process in um, uh, qualitative research can be a little tricky. And I should point out that the process in qualitative research is never linear, which means that you can't say that you move from this step and you go to the next step and it goes on and on like that. Not exactly, it doesn't work exactly like that with qualitative uh, research, okay. And I say that your data management begins with uh, your note taking. Okay, an essential part of um, the management of qualitative data is not taken, it's key. And then we also code, but the way we code in qualitative research is different from uh, how we code uh, in quantitative uh, data analysis. When you code qualitative data, it's possible that the content you have co coded uh, at a particular node, you have coded at a particular theme, will also be coded uh, at another theme. Uh, typically, I, I liken uh, coding, maybe using MVP for instance, I, I liken coding with uh, sorting clothes into different boxes. So some of us have maybe boxes for, um, for casual wares, we have boxes for uh, maybe church wares, boxes for party wares and things like that. And so you can sort your clothes into those different boxes. But it is possible that there is one particular cloth that fits into two boxes. And this is where uh, qualitative research is significantly different from uh, quantitative coding. Okay. And then we also use annotations a lot. So if you're uh, annotating, it means that you're creating short notes about specific contents of maybe your transcripts or other uh, data forms. Memoing is also another note taking uh, process, but with memos. So memos are like, are like uh, journals or like uh, maybe jotters where you write down your observations, your interpretations, your insights, your inter uh, the ideas that you're getting from uh, your data. Also, uh, we, we do much of concept mapping when we're analyzing qualitative uh, data. So, and the concept map is just a graphical representation of maybe uh, relationships uh, between concepts, then the writing of the results is also an essential part of the analysis, which means that with qualitative research, your analysis is not complete until you're done with the writing of uh, the results. So the writing of the result is not different, is not completely different from uh, the analysis in qualitative research. As you write, you continue to refine uh, uh, your results, you, re you refine your, your data. So that um, so you'll see that uh, qualitative research 
is not so much of uh, a science in the very strict uh, sense, but it generates a uh, very rich uh, data that we use in the social sciences. And so um, we could say that there is uh, a measure of subjectivity in social research and like it's as though I was preempting uh, the previous speakers uh, who said is, is sociology, for instance, uh, a science, is social science data analysis really objective? Can we say that this is really objective? So the, I'll say that it is yes and it is no. It is objective because so a large extent we are able to follow a number of steps, a number of uh, procedures, and you are able to also set aside your biases in the analysis, which means that if properly done, um, you, you don't allow your, your personal bias influence the results or your interpretation of uh, the result. But we also know that the researcher's subjective view and choice of what is to be investigated is a major factor. And that affects even uh, the, uh, the natural sciences because people have research interests, okay? So, and then you could also say that, um, especially with qualitative research, you could say that, like some people say, they say, you will always find what you want to find if you're dealing with qualitative research, even though this is not exactly true, because it is possible that beforehand you, on, you um, uh, clearly document your own personal biases, your own personal beliefs, and then take steps to, uh, to make sure that your personal uh, biases uh, do not influence the outcome of your analysis. And like, uh, um, uh, um, like some of us know, quantitative analysis is also not immune from, uh, from subjectivity. So it's not just um, a problem for qualitative research. And I am use, I'm sharing this, um, this table so we can see also how uh, we can arrive at different conclusions with the same data set. Okay, so this is uh, hypothetical. Let us assume that in our study, we are looking at the question of whether uh, marijuana use should be legalized. And we are interested in comparing the views of students in public universities with the views of students in uh, private universities. And we see here that in the private university, 39 of them said, yes, legalize it. 42 said no. And then five of them undecided. But for the public school, also the same number, 39, said, oh yes, legalize it. But only 20 said no. 27 of them said, don't know. Okay. So the now, if we analyze this data, if we do simple uh, percentage analysis, for instance, with the undecided don't know category included, this is what we will have. And the conclusion will be that um, private universities, uh, private university students are more likely to approve of the legalize, uh, uh, of legalizing uh, marijuana use because it shows there 45%, 46% approximately of them are saying yes, um, uh, legalize the use of marijuana, even though if we run a uh, test, this is not likely to be statistically significant. But what we see here shows that there is uh, a marginal difference with private uh, university students uh, approving of it more. But if the moment you take away the undecided don't know category, you see that the picture changes completely. And here you'll see that um, uh, you have more public university students 
saying it should be legalized just because we took away the uh the third category and the the, the reality is that we can say there is whether you are talking about the second um the first uh percentage analysis or the second percentage analysis you can say uh one is wrong the other is right it all depends on what you want to do and what you want to say so this shows us how subjectivity can play um a major role in our analysis and the uh conclusions we reach if for instance my interest is to paint um is to paint private university students in bad in bad lights i will use the first percentage analysis and i will run with that okay so it's also important that we are familiar with um, major ethical issues in analysis. For instance, it is unethical uh, uh, to uh, selectively search for quotes that support a researcher's view, especially when you're using qualitative research uh, data. Sometimes people, because they have their biases, uh, then they just, on the lookout for um, specific quotes that supports uh, their biases, supports their views, and this should not be so. But with uh, NVivo, for instance, you are able to show uh, maybe you, you are able to show in numerical terms uh, how many respond, how many uh, study participants referenced a particular uh a particular theme talked about a particular thing or uh, or maybe uh shared a particular view a particular sentiment okay and then it's also possible to manipulate data and these are unethical practices sometimes people will manipulate uh, the data they just continue to play around the figures until they get the results uh, the ones. And I recall that there was a particular student who gave his work to someone to analyze in my department many years ago. And he told the person specifically, I want everything to be statistically significant. The moment you do that, you're no longer doing research. We could call it witchcraft or whatever. Okay, because you have you have a you have made up your mind what to find out even before doing your analysis it's not meant to be so and the same thing applies to data mining you pick um a data set and you run so many tests and then you pick the ones that are statistically significant and you write your paper based on those ones that are statistically significant it should not be so if you want to do that, then you should disclose all the other tests that you ran that were not uh, statistically uh, significant, because there is always that likelihood that uh, that by chance uh, your your hypothesis will be will be accepted, even when it should not be accepted, and that's why we talk about uh, different types of uh, errors uh in statistical analysis so in conclusion i want to point out again that data analysis can be very nuanced nuanced that is it can vary by the data type the type of data you have will determine the type of analysis uh, that uh, will be appropriate and when we talk about data, I want us to be open-minded, to be broad in our thinking, to consider that we are not just talking about statistical or numerical data or quantitative data strictly, but also about qualitative data. And qualitative data contributes so much to uh, the body of knowledge in the social sciences. Uh, it's all, it also varies by uh, the purpose of the study and also by individual preferences, uh, by people's uh, uh, worldviews and philosophies. Okay, 
but we should also remind ourselves that uh, data analysis has implications for uh, the interventions that we put in place to address social problems. Uh, data analysis has implications for the policies, particularly in places where people, uh, people develop policies uh, based on evidence. So as social researchers, we should be careful what, um, what we do, because you never can tell when, uh, when someone in uh, a position to, to make policies will begin to, to search for studies in a particular area uh, and uh, will depend on the conclusions that you have reached to, um, to develop policies, okay? Also in determining what the problems are, what exactly are problems, what are the social problems, okay? So um, the data we have, the, how we analyze our data, the results we get, the interpretations we give matter for determining what the problems are. They also matter for what solutions will work or what experts will think uh, will work. And finally, uh, I'll say that it's good that academic institutions, government ministries, departments, agencies, and organizations should. Uh, it's, it's good that they all invest more in research and in data analysis uh, training. What we have now is not a training, it's just a webinar, I guess, that will just uh, whet our appetites uh, but it's important that um, institutions commit more to, um, to training uh, uh, the faculty as well as students in data management. I thank you all for your time. Thank you for listening. for that quite quantitative and qualitative presentation. A round of applause again. Having had the opportunity to learn, unlearn and relearn, I guess we'll have questions. So this segment, we're gonna be harvesting questions that uh, probably you have as coming from the Presentation. If you have questions, just indicate by raising your hand, and then we'll have us the questions. While we're waiting for the questions to come up, we'll at this juncture like to take goodwill message from Dr. Grace Etete Peters, who is online. Can we have her now, please? A round of applause for her, please. Is she online? Okay, so, all right. So while we're waiting for her to come online, if you have questions, please indicate by raising your hand. Online, if you have questions, and those of us who are here, would like to take questions now, please. All right, sir. We'll have one hand up, Dr. Gonlade. Yes, Dr. Arisuku, please come forward, sir. A round of applause for Dr. Ogunladi as he comes forward for his questions. We'll take the two questions together and then we'll have responses. Thank you very much. Uh, congratulations to Dr. Michael Kunuji for a very good presentation. I just want to um, ask you to do a little um, speech on triangulation mixed method 
if it's possible. Thank you very much. All right, sir. Dr. Arisukun, we'll take you now, sir. Okay, I want to appreciate the presenter. It was a beautiful presentation and uh, I've learned a lot personally. However, I have a question. Uh, I teach research methodology as well. And uh, one of the questions that commonly propped up in our classes among students is the choice of which method, qualitative or quantitative, what informs that choice? So I would like the presenter to provide answers to that. Secondly, uh, recently due to the COVID-19 challenges, people, especially in Nigeria, a bit scared and worried of going to collect data in the field. And so a lot of people now rely on secondary data, secondary data, MBS, World Bank reports, Central Bank reports, and all that. So my question is, how reliable, especially when we don't know uh, what informed those researches, or can we combine the two, just like uh, the former speaker asked? Thank you. All right, thank you very much. We'd like to have your response now, Dr. Kuniji. Hello, thank you. Thank you, Ma. And uh, thanks to uh, uh, those who raised these questions. The first question is on mixed uh, methods. Yes, the uh, reality is that uh, both methods can be used together, whether you're talking about um, qualitative methods or quantitative methods, it's possible that you use uh, both methods. And in fact, even if you're using a qualitative, if you're doing a, com um, a complete qualitative uh, study, it's possible to combine different methods, which means that you could have maybe focus group discussions and at the same time uh, conduct maybe interviews and things like that. It's also possible that you have a survey uh, that you have combined with other methods. So it is possible to combine uh, methods. Uh, a major challenge with that sometimes will be that uh, the results may not necessarily agree. In which case, as researchers, we expect that we also document this, that we show uh, where maybe the qualitative data uh, we have uh, do not agree with uh, maybe our survey, our survey data. So yes, it, it makes sense to combine methods. And the reason is that uh, sometimes um, what you are not able to document with your quantitative uh, method a qualitative method can help you document. Uh, the qualitative method, for instance, can help you uh, document uh, context. If you want to truly understand social contexts, you will need uh, to use the qualitative technique. Okay. And I'll quickly refer to the verbal and social autopsy of Nigeria that was concluded in 2020. Uh, those of us who are familiar with the demographic and health survey, we know that the DHS is uh, purely quantitative, it is a survey. And in fact, in terms of thematic coverage, the DHS is the biggest survey in Nigeria and in several other countries of the world. The DHS is conducted in many countries of the world. After the DHS, there was a follow-up study that study included all the mothers who reported child deaths in the five-year period that uh, was covered in the DHS. Okay, so, and the idea was to document the causes of under five deaths across Nigeria. So that's also a survey. But the first verbal and social autopsy that was done in 2014 came up with more questions than answers. So, 
For instance, uh, a mother would say, oh, I took the child to the hospital, or, so the child was sick. I brought the child back, the child died at home. The question is why? Why did you bring that child when the child was not getting better? When was the child, was the child uh, maybe uh, discharged? Some will say no. Okay, so what contextual issues are responsible for the decisions parents take? So to understand that, if we're interested in that, then we may need to move away from uh, uh, that survey. And that's what was done in 2019 and 2020. So we now uh, did a verbalist autopsy that um, has a survey component as well as a qualitative component. So the qualitative component uh, interviewed caregivers also organized focus group discussions with community members and uh, also in-depth interviews with uh, service providers in communities with high uh, child mortality. So all of those things were used to better understand the context. They were used to better understand the beliefs of the people, the health beliefs, for instance. If we're talking about the health beliefs of the people, a survey is not likely to clearly show us that. What are the beliefs of the people? Okay, but a qualitative study uh, will do that. And that takes us to the second uh, question. The second question is, um, what informs the choice of methods? So I say research is like fishing. And those of us who are from riverine areas who fish, we know that the word fishing is a general word for catching many marine animals, including crabs, fish, and uh, so many other things that you find. So those of us who grew up in the village, we know that there are so many fishing tools, including a god or something that looks like a calabash. This, um, uh, what do you call it? This local pot. If I tell some people uh, that is used for fishing, uh, they will be surprised, but that's the reality. You can also use hook. You can also use nets. Now the question is what informs which you use part-time? And my response is, what do you intend to catch? It is what you intend to catch that will inform what tool is appropriate. So just like I said, if your interest is to document people's beliefs and you say you want to do a survey, you're not likely to, to achieve much. So those are some of the things. Ask yourself clearly, what do we want to, um, what do we want to achieve? What do we want to document? That should inform uh, the tools or the method that's most appropriate. And then uh, to the last question, people use secondary data, um, how reliable? In fact, I should say that the secondary data that people use are more reliable than the primary data that we often collect. And I have been involved in some of those studies I've been involved in some of those big studies and I know that so much rigor goes into the data collection. For And I'll still go back to that example of the demographic and health survey. One, the instrument is a standardized instrument that is that has been used and tested in many countries of the world and uh, the uh, people who conduct the study still continue to make it better. They continue to refine it. So that makes it a very robust tool, okay? In addition to that, so many other considerations, so many other things are considered before uh, deploying those uh, big surveys. Um, for instance, ethical issues. You're not likely to do any of those big studies without getting uh, ethics approval, getting clearance from uh, maybe the National Health Research Ethics Committee or from a reputable uh, 
uh, ethics review board. But it's possible, for instance, that you just collect data uh, locally. In fact, some, some of our students will just uh, enter a community here. There will be no informed consent. They just begin to interview people. So the, the long and short is that with many of the small surveys, so many things can go wrong. But the, uh, the big surveys are better organized. They are better funded. Of course, they are better organized because they are better funded. Many of them are funded by uh, big donors, USAID, and many other uh, big donors, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation. So uh, they don't lack funds. And so they are able to organize those surveys better. So I will even encourage more people to use uh, secondary data if they can access the raw data to use secondary data, uh, analyze the secondary data. They'll get uh, more useful uh, information than studies that are, that are done um, sometimes in an unprofessional way. So I hope I have, I've responded to the questions. All right. Um, do we have more questions? All right, thank you very much. To take us further in this event, permit me to invite the person that will be taking the webinar appraisal in the person of Professor B.O. Adevinson. Thank you, the Master of Events or the Vice Chancellor, sir. Uh, still standing on the already established protocols. Um, the guest uh, lecturer for this webinar is Dr. Michael Kunuji, and uh, he spoke on understanding the dynamics of data analysis and interpretations in social science research. Of course, I want to believe that it's not only in the social uh, sciences, it cut across. So, um, by way of introduction, he spoke about uh, data analysis, which involves the process of transforming raw data into results. He also mentioned data interpretation, uh, which is making sense of data results, uh, leveraging on what does the result mean? Why must it be so? and what conclusions can be drawn from such inference. He spoke about data management, which is more broader, uh, consisting of data collection, screening, editing, and coding, after which uh, one will do data entry in form of capturing. Then you clean the data before moving into the analysis. And of course, the data interpretation to give the expected results. Um, he spoke on the two general forms of data, which are qualitative and quantitative. While the quantitative is deductive and uh, numerical, the qualitative is non-numerical and inductive in nature. He mentioned the sources of these two forms, quantitative, could be realized from survey, from experiments, and from big data, and so on. While qualitative can be generated from interviews, observations, meetings, and the likes. Still speaking on the quantitative analysis, it made us to realize that they are descriptive or explanatory in nature. They could be univariate, uh, talking about single variable, and uh, good examples of that are pie chart, pie chart, Instagram, and the likes. It could be bivariate, involving two variables simultaneously, and uh, 
this kind of uh, bivariate analysis establish relationships and not necessarily the causation from one to the other. You also mentioned that it could be multivariate, talking about simultaneous analysis of more than two variables, especially of relevant to the social sciences. And uh, talking about the qualitative, which is seldom used, but now coming to the fore in social sciences research, it is always descriptive, providing details on the phenomena about which uh, little is known. It also talks about grand theory, that is establishing uh, patterns in form of theories. Uh, under qualitative analysis, you can also have a conversational analysis, which is socially structured human behavior. Uh, and of course, not forgetting the content analysis. Um, it spoke about processes involved in qualitative research, ranging from note-taking to coding, to annotation, and of course, to memory, and uh, moving to concept mapping, as well as ensuring that the results are well written. I talk about the measure of subjectivity in social research, uh, asking questions whether social, uh, social science data analysis are objective. He made a demonstration of uh, same data, different conclusions, revealing the place of subjectivity in data analysis to the one concern. He also raised ethical issues that must be followed and even followed strictly, talking about uh, searching for codes that support researchers' views, uh, data manipulation, and of course, data mining, uh, which is the need to report all the tests conducted, uh, not only some selected significant ones, but everything so that uh, the true picture of the research can naturally be brought to the fore. Uh, in conclusion, it made us to realize that data analysis can vary by three major factors. One is the data type, second is the purpose of study, and third, of course, is the individual preferences with respect to a particular research. Um, data it made us to realize that it has implications for interventions and policies. And uh, at another forum, it was uh, agreed that wrong data will give wrong interpretation and will bring wrong intervention and thereby wrong policy. Uh, he also made us to realize that academic institutions, government agencies and organizations should endeavor to invest in research and data analysis training, making us to realize that this is by way of appetizing ourselves, that the training is essential and of essence if we are, uh, need to know more in this direction. And uh, lastly, it made us to realize that what will inform, inform the choice of tool or equipment to use is what you actually want to get. Thank you. A round of applause once more for that succinct appraisal by Professor Adebesin. At this juncture, I have the singular honor and privilege to invite, as I ask you to all rise, our amiable Vice Chancellor, Professor Ademi Olayonju, to take the closing remarks. A round of applause for him, please. Thank you, the mistress of the event. You may please be seated. Wow, what a day, what a time. I want to believe we have been refreshed and we have been imparted on. Even though there is a space for photo of times, I want to specially 
appreciate our guest speaker. Thank you for making us to share from your wealth of uh, knowledge. And thank you for also challenging us as management of this great university. We may not be where we want to be, but I want to believe that Landmark University is already taking care of that aspect. We may need to put in more fund into research, but it may interest you to know that the venue at which we are carrying out this webinar is the Landmark University Center for Research, Innovation and Discoveries. In this all, we have 17 Sustainable Development Goals stand. And each of these is manned by a team lead that has a secretary. In other words, we have 17 team leaders. We also have 17 team secretaries. And also every member of the faculty of this great university belong to at least three of such uh, goals. It may also interest you to know, sir, that the example that you gave with respect to the type of fishing tools, the moment you mentioned that, my eyes just went to our sustainable development goal 14 stand. And those in this hall will be our may witness that all that you mentioned about all the fishing types, we're just looking at them just before us. And I want, okay, thank you, studio for beaming it, just let's uh, take it, not just the stand, let him see those different guards, the different fishing tools that we have on that stand. And like you rightly said, sir, it's a function of the fish that we want to catch. It's also a function of the volume of water available on that particular area, and also a function of the slope of the flowing water. Having said that, just yesterday, we inaugurated an implementation working group for Times Higher Education Appearance. And the chairman of that group is still the director of Landmark University Center for Research, Innovation and Discovery. Why am I mentioning this? Your presentation and by extension, this webinar, is very useful to them because they are going to be collating data across all the university units, directorates, departments, colleges. Why are we doing this? It's because we want to appear in the next time higher education world ranking. And they will start their own ranking internally before we appear. So, they are going to be exploring both the qualitative and the quantitative method. So it's on this note that once again, I want to thank every participant. I want to thank you for your time. Our students who are presently writing their exam, and yet they sat through this event. I want to commend you. Can you give it to yourself? You are kings and queens of Landmark University indeed. I acknowledge our postgraduate uh, student who, of course, have taken this venue as their own base. If 24 seven, part time, you must meet one particular postgraduate student on this ground. And that is how it should be. I want to also put it as a challenge to our faculty also, that here you have 24 seven internet. I wanted to say 24 seven light, but since the light has been going and coming, I may not be able to say, by percentage, don't represent, but 95% of the time, the light here is stable. So you can always come. More importantly, I want to congratulate the faculty and staff of the Department of, uh, like my dean we say, sociology. And then, of course, the people from the College of Business and Social Sciences. We want to thank you for coming down with us uh, for the success of this 15 look read webinar. Once again, thank you and God bless. It's on this note, even though we didn't declare it, we are closing it in the name of God the Father, God the Son, 
and God the Holy Spirit. Thank you and God bless. Thank you, sir. Dr. Arisuku for the vote of thanks. A round of applause for him as he comes forward, please. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Standing on the existing protocol, uh, I will quickly point out that we sociologists focus on many three things. We understand or comprehend social problems. We attempt to predict it, and then we control by way of uh, policies and suggestions. And in all of these, data is central. And so it's just to reemphasize the, uh, the usefulness and the benefits of this particular webinar to all social scientists. Having said that, we want to appreciate God Almighty who made this day possible. We can fix a date, but it's only God that will make the events happen. And we appreciate him. We appreciate our chancellor, the pro-chancellor, we thank the management team, ably led by our vice chancellor, who is here presently. And uh, just to add that he has been the arrowhead driving research in Landmark University. And uh, we keep learning, keep having series of webinars to perfect our research. We appreciate the presenter for letting us realize that data is light. Without light, without data, we are wallowing in darkness and we cannot provide any solution. And so we thank him for teaching and giving us the details. Our students, I am sure, have learned a lot. And we also will strive to implement this in our further research engagement. We thank you so much, sir, for the privilege of drinking from your fountain of knowledge. And we thank all the faculty, we thank all the students of Landmark University. And we say, as our VC always says, come down with us. And Landmark is ready to do you good. Thank you, everybody. God bless you. Thank you very much, Dr. Risopo, for that wonderfully delivered vote of thanks. I want to believe you are also in a better position to drive this home, being a research methodology teacher in the department. Thank you very much, sir. To bring us to the close of this event, permit me to, to please welcome on board Dr. Peter Ogunlade for closing prayer. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the successful completion of this uh, program. We thank you for the organizers of this uh, program. We thank you for the management of Landmark University. Thank you, Lord. That has always sponsored laudable programs like this. Thank you, Father. We thank you for all the participants we thank you wonderfully for the guest lecturer whom yes, you have used for this program. Yes, Father, we say to you be all the glory and the honor in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, we say, we pray that all the benefits of this program will be uh, first or be actualized in the life of every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we are asking that we will see the effect in the academic work of our students in Jesus' name. Amen. And Father, we pray that the Landmark University as an institution will be lifted up as a result of this program in the name of Jesus. Amen. Lord, we ask, oh God, that your peace will abide with every one of us Amen. as we close this program in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, thank you, Lord, because we thank know you have you, answered. Father. Let only be glorified. Amen. For in Jesus' wonderful name, we pray. Amen. Amen. And we all say to the guest speaker, we love you. Thank you, sir. Group photograph outside. Thank you, and God bless. Thank you. I love you all, too. Thank you. Outside. Thank you.